you have to put the customer experience at the front of every decision you make. Today on the podcast, I am speaking with one of the most famous Michelin starred chefs in the UK today, Phil Howard. Phil is most well known for owning the two Michelin starred iconic square restaurant in London for over two decades, his countless TV shows, his award winning cookbooks, and today he owns and operates some of the coolest and hottest restaurants in the city of London. If you haven't already done so, click the subscribe button to get brand new episodes every single week directly to your feed. Absolutely great to have you on the podcast to get to chat with you, so uh, thanks so much. That's a pleasure, great to be here. Uh, right, uh, look, we have, we have only so much time and I have loads of questions for you, so we're going to jump straight into it. Um, but just to start, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, maybe something different than kind of uh, a lot of the interviews that you've done in the past and that's more from the perspective of because obviously you've gotten a lot of huge amount of acclaim you know as a chef but I'd love to talk to you about kind of more from the perspective and this podcast is more about the business side of restaurants uh, as a restaurant owner right um, and you know uh, operating some of the best restaurants in London um, so if that's okay with you I'd love to just kind of go down that rabbit hole a little bit with you um, yeah. and, and maybe what better way to start, a uh, better place to start even, uh, than, you know, back in the early 90s when you opened up your, your first restaurant, The Square. Uh, could, could we just kind of start with, with that journey? Listen, in the end, if you try and interrogate me about the business of running restaurants, it's going to get, it, it, will, it will start to sound a bit like a, bro- like a broken record because I don't <laughs> have a, um, hey, listen, I've got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got things to say, obviously, and I've got, I've got, I've got opinions based on, you know, a career of 35 years. But um, it is, uh, you know, I don't make a meal of it. And I, don't, and I look at it in quite a simplistic kind of, kind of way. Um, but listen, the opening of the square was an, it was an extraordinary time in life. It came, you know, my involvement with the square came around through, through a strange sequence of events. Um, my, uh, my business partner, Nigel Platz-Martin, who was then my boss, I started off as just an employee, um, was uh, uh, Marco's partner at Harvey's, and um, and I worked at Harvey's. So that was so, so that was the link. Um, uh, originally, um, Marco was going to be very much involved with with the square, and and that's not how it panned out through through their through their relationship. They decided to uh, to part ways, and so I ended in at the I ended up, you know, at the ripe old age of twenty three. Um, Having never really even worked as a chef to party to before, to be honest with you, I probably was a chef to party ish, but not 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 a not a complete one. Uh, opening the restaurant, so I would I would say uh, hand on heart, there was more ambition and energy and drive and passion and love thrown at the square by both myself and my business partner um, than 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 than. Uh, 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 you know, there was as much of all of that thrown at it as you could possibly do. Um, but it was kind of, it was, you know, it was offset by a huge amount, certainly on my behalf of, um, uh, of ill experience, naivety. Um, I just was not a head chef in any way, shape or form. I just had, I'd never placed an order in my life. I had no relationship with suppliers because I'd never placed an order. I'd never recruited somebody. I'd never, I'd no, I, you know, I was a t- sort of, chef to party at best um and Nigel my partner as much as he was a had had had, had owned Harvey's you know that was a very particular kind of restaurant you know with 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 Marco and so we started off in a in a, in a really unusual um setup with very little um know-how um but the bottom line in some ways cooking is not you know running restaurants is not complicated you've got to serve some great food you've got to look after people and try and make some money doing it and certainly with Nigel up front we had somebody who was absolutely determined to get to you know he'd 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 he'd, he'd put everything that you know he was a businessman beforehand um done well but not made millions you know but he'd, he'd, he'd made enough to to invest everything he had into this restaurant um I came in um and between the two of us, we, 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 we made it work. He drove the business. Um, I think it's impossible to, to communicate 
the intensity with which Nigel um, drove the business, forging relationships with with theatres, with um, you know it, hotels, with concierges, with you know any anything he could do, he was twenty four seven obsessed with um, ensuring that customers would walk through the door. No one knew who he was. No one knew who I was. We were tucked away in a back street in, in, uh, in the West End. We had to work it. Um, and I just, uh, so, so, that, so that's, that's the critical role that he played in the early, in, let's say in the first year. I just cooked my heart out. At the end of the day, I was born with a good palate. I'd done enough cooking to know um, I had an intuitive understanding of, of, of what good food was about. So I just let rip on that, on that front. And, um, and it was a very different world then, you know? So if you did a good job, there just was not the competition that you have these days. Yeah. That's not to undermine our achievements, but it's bottom line is there just wasn't the competition. So we, you know, with Nigel out front driving business, packing that dining room out, me just cooking my heart out downstairs, um, we put together a, a, an eclectic but a good team. Um, uh, like I said, nobody knew who we were, so there wasn't a reputation that was that that was that was attracting people. We just had to get out there and find staff. We put together a good team, um, and the truth is, for 1990, 1991, we opened, we, we 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 put together a restaurant that was of significance. You know, it was it was it was just different. It had energy about it. It was busy. It was serving great food to a standard, um, and and so really, it was. It was a, it was a great restaurant. It was far from perfect. You know, we you know. We focused on filling it. And, and, and making sure it was packed. And with that came lots of struggles. Um, and, uh, but in the end, that was the most important thing to do, was to establish and, and a reputation. Sorry, sorry to put across the field. Just on that point, I'd love to ask you about um, kind of some of those, or I suppose, you know, you mentioned you're kind of thrown in the deep end almost as a chef de partie, um, and there was lots of mistakes. I, I always find it interesting kind of, because from the outset, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, likes myself and other people that don't know, uh, you know, the ins and outs would kind of look and just see it as a huge success, right? And, and everything you've touched has almost turned to gold. And I'd love to just ask you, like, what were, like, are there any kind of standout mistakes or obstacles you overcame with the square? Well, listen, there, you know, there, there are lots of, there's lots of, uh, you know, f you know, extraordinary little things that based yeah. that were really due to the fact that I had not ever been in a position of responsibility for. So when it came to putting the orders in, you know, I'd never, I'd never, didn't have a, a structured order sheet, you know, with a list of suppliers and all the products we got from them every day at the beginning of service for the first six months, we just used to sit down and think about what we needed. And that was just a ridiculous kind of waste, waste, waste of time. But, you know, so, so there were lots of areas of, of, of unnecessary struggle, just born out of, born out of naivety. But I, I, would, I would perhaps say that um, looking back, one of the things that's, that, that is very real in the restaurant business um, and feels very real is that we are all so time poor. You know, you are, we, you know, I could not have worked any harder, uh, slept any less. And yet somehow there was so much more that I felt that needed to be done that there was just no time for. So, for example, we opened with a very tight team. Um, God knows how, but we did manage to recruit a few people. I had I had a couple of chefs come in um, from a lovely restaurant called Place Bodegrois in, in uh, up in uh, up in Wales, which was closed during the winter. And I kind of knew the the owner, Chris uh, Chris Chown. Um, so he lent me his his two chefs for the for the for the winter. Um, but inevitably, actually, when they when they left, when he needed them back, I just recruiting is you know that's the one thing that I think certainly in the early years and even still now if you don't focus on recruiting you're 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 pissing in the wind because the reality is it doesn't matter what dreams I've got what ambition I've got what ideas I've got um or my partner's got or any of the if you don't have a team to execute you don't have a team to execute and no matter how in the shit you are on any given day if you need to recruit for example you have to make 15 minutes in that day to focus on 
where you're going to find that member of staff. How are you going to find the next great head chef? How are you going to find the pastry chef, sommelier? How are you going to find the kitchen porter? Every single employee in a tight and well-run restaurant is a really important cog in the mechanics of, of, of that restaurant. You can't just say, we'll do that later. Customers are going to walk through the door. Everything is in real time. And if you can't deliver, um, you, you can't deliver. And so that's perhaps what I would, I would, I would single out as the, as the, as the one overriding um, issue that I've had through those early years was just not creating the time to focus on looking after the team um, and recruiting, building, building the team. Right. Very good. No, that, and in that, turn, that just that just causes so much struggle, you know. Um, and uh, so that, that, that is absolutely key. And, 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 and equally, it's just most things, you know, your rent is your rent, your rates is your rates, you know, your yeah. electricity bill is your electricity bill, your gas is your gas, you know, this is your that. If you don't look after the food margin as the other, you know, um, it, you have to create a viable business quickly. Yeah. And um, chefs on the whole, we're not interested in food, in, in food margins, GPs. We're interested in pleasing customers. You know, we're far, yeah. we've got far, our egos are far too big. All we want to do is cook our hearts out, put a beautiful big portion of sea bass on the plate, the biggest dollar of a caviar we can get away with, or the greatest longest eats, or new season sets, chasing. What makes our passion for cooking is not interested in the business side of running restaurants. But if you if you forego that, you forego it at your own peril. Can I can I it's can good. I just pick up on that point, uh, Phil, and we, we'll move on from the square because there's so much more to talk about. But uh, going forward to Elston Street then, um, when you opened there in 2016. Um, uh, so like I'd love to get your opinion on that because obviously you had you know you had two Michelin stars for, for years with the square. Um, and then uh, when you opened Elston Street, and I know obviously you went on to win a Michelin star, but um, like, was that like, because you mentioned there about, you know, it's about, you know, getting the right margin on your food and, you know, you know, it's very easy, you know, piling in on caviar and all that will make it delicious. But I'd love to just get pick up on that point, which is when you opened up uh, the, the new restaurant, um, did you want a Michelin star or were you more focused on making a profitable restaurant? Or how, how, how does that work in your head? Listen, it was it was kind of neither of those things. I, I suppose, okay. if I'm really honest, I felt that um, uh, you know, one star is about just cooking great food, and um, they're, they're, Michelin have have uh, have, have uh, given one star to enough to, a, a, a broad enough range of restaurants now for us to see that actually it's not about having fancy tablecloths and space between the tables. None of that crap. It's about good, consistent food, and yeah. so I always felt that's that's basically the level at which we're going to operate. And um, so I, I wouldn't say we. We wanted a star, or or that certainly wasn't it certainly wasn't a, a goal, but that's the level that I expected us to to to, to, to go in and bat at. Elizabeth Street was far more about, um, you know, like I said, I was in the privileged position, ha having achieved more than I'd ever dreamed of as a as, as a as a cook. Um, so I could park all that ambition to one side um, and take with me, you know, thirty years of experience and just say, right, what do we want to do here? Let's, give, let's, let's open a restaurant that we feel is absolutely relevant, which is the key word for, for it's the single most important word. A restaurant relevant for its location that's going to give great pleasure. And, um, and yes, be, 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 be full. Um, that, that's really what you want, is you want a full, buzzing, successful restaurant. And there's no two ways about it. Towards the end at the square, as much as it was still a huge success, you could feel in your bones where 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 it where the square was going the, you know the trend was gradually very slowly sales were covers were dropping um and there's all sorts of reasons in there but 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 the bottom line is londoners we live in an area where we're privileged to have extraordinary range of restaurants when i opened the square and i started cooking if you wanted to have a truly great meal, you had to go to a posh French restaurant, basically. Yeah. And that's just so not the case now. If you want to eat great food now, you can go to uh, Black Axe Mangal, you can go to Perilla, you can go to, you know, Claude, but, you know, there's a whole the range of experience that will still deliver a great eating experience is extraordinary. And so it was about pitching the restaurant at the level that we felt was right. Um, and uh, so we wanted it to be informal. 
but great food. Um, the whole, we want to be intelligent about it. Um, one thing that had changed radically through the years of the square was, um, you know, in the opening years, if a vegetarian appeared on the scene, it was a sort of notable event. You know, once a week, you might get somebody, um, a vegetarian at the end. Dietary requirements to put them under one umbrella was a huge part of delivering service. And to be quite honest with you, if you didn't embrace it, it was a headache. Yeah. Because it's complex and it's a responsibility. You know, if somebody's allergic, they're allergic. You've got to you've got to deal with it and get it right. Yet, yet the requests and the the fickleness of of of, um, of 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 guests and people just saying I'm allergic to garlic just because they don't want it. You know, the whole thing became gr a grey area, but ultimately one that you had to deal with. And so I decided that at the Ellison Street, I wanted to include vegetarians through the majority of the menu. I wanted to make sure we had vegan dishes because I wanted them to get the same energy and passion that the rest of the menu had. Um, I wanted to try and make sure that we always had plenty of dishes that didn't have dairy in them and they were gluten-free so that all that, the vast majority of that issue was dealt with on the a la carte. And so it makes the, made, made, made Ellison Street attractive to, to everybody because it didn't alienate anyone. It wasn't meat heavy, fish heavy, vegetable. It was just a, a, a truly balanced menu that, um, that was attractive to, to, um, to everybody. And um, so I think that was quite progressive. Um, and so Ellison Street was really about just trying to open a restaurant that was, um, that was that was going to give people a great time. Uh, yes, it was it was about running a good business, um, yeah. and we 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 pitched it at a level from a price point of view that was you know it's certainly it's certainly not cheap, but it's great value. Um, as a cook, I felt I'd kind of earned the earned the right to um, be able to. This I don't you know we don't use caviar, we don't use foie gras, we don't use yeah. longestines. We don't, you know we they're so it's not it's not about trying to be. Uh, indulgent but it's about I love food I love ingredients I love the seasons and, and and I do want to be able to occasionally use turbot or sea bass or you know loin of venison or an amazing amazing piece of ribeye and that costs money you need to be able to charge a certain amount of money for it so we pitched it at a level that would enable me to use most of nature's wonderful ingredients excellent I'd love to just pick up on a point there Phil that you said there at the beginning which was uh that your the restaurant the, the key is to have your restaurant or, or concept relevant to the location. I think that's yeah. a very interesting point. And um, can we just expand on that for a second? Like, let's say, had you found a, a you might not have done this, but had you found a location in say Soho, uh, would like obviously it wouldn't be Ellison Street, but would it have been a very yeah. different concept? Listen, I think I think basically, I, I felt after the square, I was going to take some time, some proper time out. And in the end, that didn't happen because. Uh, I foolishly went and looked at a site that somebody said was great and, and, and that was the Ellison Street site. And I just felt in my heart, I said, this is the site for me. If I'm going to do another restaurant, it is the one that this is the site for me. I felt it was absolutely the right site for me to deliver food that, that I can deliver. Go, to Going back to your question, I wouldn't take a site in, uh, in Stratford. Right. Soho, because I just don't think um, I have it in me to genuinely and honestly deliver a product that would maximise the potential of a site in that location, in in, the, in those locations. I mean, that's that's maybe being a little bit extreme, but ultimately, uh, you know, Soho's got perhaps a, a, broad, a broader range. But the, the the point is that when you're when you're young, you want to cook your heart out and show the world what you can cook. And, uh, and that's a great and powerful and wonderful thing. But it is um, sometimes at the expense of, 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 of being logical and strategic about it. You have to look at where is, where is your restaurant? Who, are your, who is your customer base? And unless you're going to be a world-class, you know, three Michelin star uh, operation that's gonna attract people from all over the world, you have to basically look at your locals and say, what do they want? What do they need? Yeah. What's going to attract them? What's, what's going to bring them through the door? And so, you know, given where we were, I think we pretty much, we, we pretty much, pretty much got it right. You know, I always say to my, you know, when, I, when I've had somebody work at, uh, work for me for two or three years and they, they leave, I want to, I want to try and give people great advice. And, and if they have come from, 
it's all about making sure when people move on that they go on to a mass experience that's going to help them achieve what they want to achieve. And if they want to go back to rural England or to Brisbane in Australia, they have to think about who their clientele is going to be. There's, on the whole, little point in going and working at the Fat Duck, for example, um, if you're going to go back to Brisbane, Australia, because the two yeah. things just don't they don't they don't they, they don't relate to each other. Um, so it is be, staying relevant is really key. And ultimately, I could feel in my heart that the square was beginning to feel increasingly irrelevant in the fast evolving food food world in London, which ultimately is what drove its sale. That it was primarily that. Um, and I also had got to a point where I just actually had had enough of cooking at that level. I just there's more to life than worrying about wilting chervil, you know, to put it to put it crassly. You know, it is, um, and uh, um, I think as we as we get older and we eat more, in the end, what we thrive on is simplicity. Excellent, love it. Uh, can, can we can we can we talk a little bit about some of your other ventures, Phil? Um, because you you, t- you mentioned there, and I, I only read it this morning when I was doing my my due diligence, you know, into the the, <laughs> the research into the interview. Um, I had one of the best meals of my life uh, in uh, or certainly the year in 2019, I think it was in Perilla. Um, and yeah. you're, you're a co-owner in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, uh, uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, it, per- it, it, yeah, sorry. Go on. I mean, Perilla is an extraordinary restaurant, you know, yeah. basically because, you know, um, certainly my, my initial interest was in Ben, you know, Ben worked, yeah. at, Ben worked at the square and, um, it became immediately obvious that he was, he was a, sp- a really special talent, particularly with vegetables. You know, his way with vegetables is extraordinary. Um, and actually it's grown to more than that, but I mean, I'd never, you know, I stood in the kitchen at the, stood, stood on the pass at the square for a long, for, for, for 25 years. And, and, um, Ben's ability to make vegetables special was unique. So that's really what I backed um, okay. and got involved with. But of course, Matt is, um, is instrumental in the restaurant success. The yeah. two of them are thick as thieves. They're great. They're a great partnership. Um, and, and, and again, you know, Stoke Newington to me, or Newington Green, it's, no, you know, it's the other side of the world as far as I'm concerned. I live in far <laughs> west London and, um, you know, it takes me an hour and a half to get there. And um, uh, so it's been a really interesting project. Um, those, it's their restaurant. They run it. Okay. I give grounded advice along with some of the other co- co-owners um, because I've been rattling around for a long time. But it's been a real lesson to me to 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 uh, to, to appreciate that Newington Green Perilla, the spirit of that restaurant needs to be needs to be governed by 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 Ben and Matt. And sometimes I don't get what they're doing. But but yes. that's because I'm a 55 year old West yeah. London boy, and this and and I have to let I have to let go of that. I realize yeah. that actually my input on occasion is not is not right. But Perilla is truly, I think it's one of the most exciting restaurants in London. I think the food is just phenomenal, and um, yeah. I'm just not that it's what it's about, but how it didn't get a start again this year, I just don't understand. Yeah, can I just um, jump in very quickly, Phil, on on that point, and we, we'll move on then. But so, like I said, I get there and it was incredible. And because I'd love to get your opinion on this, um, not, not so much as, as, you know, a partner in it, but purely just on the food, because um, like your, your philosophy on cooking and, you know, your, you know, it's been, you know, well spoke about and, and all that. And I, I would, I wouldn't say I have a similar, but I, I would love kind of classical cooking and just simple food. So um, I, I can't, I suppose, I'm trying to get your opinion on because I couldn't figure it out. I had like soup in a burnt onion and just all these yeah. crazy stuff, but it was just incredible. Like it was just delicious. So I'd love to get, what, what is it like? What makes it so Listen, good? I, I think, you know, I think ben, Ben's cooking is unique. You know, you can see yeah. it a mile away. Um, I don't relate to everything. I don't get seaweed in a salted caramel tart. I don't get, yeah. um, you know, there's some things that he does that not, not, not everything, not everything works. Okay. But the vast majority of it does, and it's just it's just different, you know. And I think his 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 the command of his craft, the craft of of cooking, he really, he's got a great grip on. Um, his food's just got identity, and and um, he he does have that ability to, to be progressive, inventive, um, different, 
but it's but but bloody hell so often it's still so delicious and um just this way you know I've been looking at plates of food for 35, 40 years, you know, mine, other people's, you know, on the, on the in magazines, on Instagram. And um, yeah, the, you know, there are, there are, there are people who do things differently out there. And, 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 but Ben is, is one of those people. You asked me to put a dish on a plate. Um, I could redress, you know, whatever it is a million times. It would never yeah. look like Ben would put it on a plate. You know, he's got a, and that's when it's when it's all right. That's special. And um, I was really anxious because you know the early the early, the first year was not easy for Perilla financially. Okay. Um, it was it was opened on a on a tight budget. Um, his food is was progressive. It's different. And I was like, shit, Ben. You know, you've got to just be a bit more mainstream here. You know, you can't have people leaving. Not quite understanding their dinner and feeling you know you need to please every single person that comes in here yeah um you look into the history of a lot of the world's great restaurants and and and, and progressive restaurants they didn't start like that you've got to you've got to create a business first and then take people on your journey and i felt i personally felt that they were imposing their journey too quickly on on on, uh, okay. on their guests but in the end the sheer quality of the cooking and 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 Matt's Matt's delivery of hospitality that and Perilla the site the restaurant it just feels great and it and it's and it's and it's and it's and it's, and it's worked and it's become it's a very successful business now it's a it's a uh, in every sense of the word it's it, it delivers great pleasure it's full it's got a really loyal following people get excited about it I get excited when I go to Perilla you know I think because. Because I do. It's an exciting place to go. Yeah, no, that, you know, I, I for one cannot wait to get back there whenever I get over to London. But a couple of quick ones to finish up on, Phil, because uh, we're running out of time and I really appreciate your time. Um, I suppose, um, you know, it's been a crazy year, right, for hospitality uh, 2020. It's not, not a year we're going to forget anytime soon. Um, but I'd love to kind of just ask you about uh, post-COVID and like, how is, has your kind of plans changed with regards to kind of new, new ventures or, or anything? No, listen, I'm, I, you know, generally I'm at a point in my career where I'm trying to kind of, you know, uh, you know, just, I'm not trying to put any more on my plate, put it, put it that way. But no, okay. I think ultimately in London, the market will be buoyant when we reopen because everyone uh, has been caged for a long time and they just, you know, Londoners, there's a lot of Londoners that love eating out. So I think it'll, I think, I think it'll be good. We will keep our takeaway business going until such point that we either just don't need it or or not. You know, if if, if, it, if it becomes a permanent fixture, one of the restaurants that I co-own with Rebecca Mascarenas is in is um, is in SW13. Our lunch trade is so weak there because it's just not that's not the that's not uh, it's, it's just it's just for a variety of reasons lunch trade is poor. So we operate our takeaways out, out of that restaurant, which means that actually it, it just it just it just fits quite well. But but no, I think, um, listen, it's the same old thing. You've got to uh, deliver great hospitality, big smiles, great food, um, uh, value for money um, and and make sure people want to come walking back through your door than rather than somebody else's. And, um, and so you just got to we just got to keep doing more of the same. You know, London's a resilient market. Um, and uh, and it would have had a big big knock. A lot of places will have will 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 not will not come out the other side. But I think ultimately, it's pretty straightforward. You've got to you've got to deliver great pleasure. Excellent. And two final ones to finish up, Phil. Um, just I, I'd I'd love to just ask you, uh, like you're you're a partner, you know, and a co-owner in all these restaurants. But I'd love to know kind of how operationally, like like what's your role within them, and like. Uh, Listen, that's probably if, if if you were to sort of think about you know what, what you know I I have the the success I've enjoyed has I really think that's at the heart of it. Um, you know, restaurants are complicated businesses. They are they are specific and they're particular. And if you want to make sure that you're delivering a great bottom line, you've got to focus on the aspect of of of, of business. And that's you know it's they are they're businesses, and you can't be at the market, be in the kitchen, be inspiring staff, be with yeah. your family, get enough sleep, 
and crawl over all the paperwork aspects. So, you know, I've had two exceptional partners. You know, Nigel was my partner at the Squares, my partner at the Ledbury, um, obviously along with Brett, um, and, uh, and and Rebecca is my partner with uh, three restaurants, and they they basically take care of the business. And what it, what it's enabled me, you know, I, I I you know, we of course talk, we have meetings, we discuss anything significant, but the reality is, when you've got all that all that side of the business being taken care of it enables me to do what I do best which is cook and um, and not get bogged down and distracted with payroll and all that kind of you know it's really important but it's 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 neither my strength um, nor have I got the time to do it and so by making sure by having by having great partners um, we are Nigel and I were a formidable hole at the square it wasn't always happy, <laughs> but we create. We were a, we were a complete team, and um, and likewise, Rebecca and I are a complete team. Um, I take care of everything to do with the kitchen, recruitment, you know, leading the teams on the sites, and and um, it enables Re- Rebecca, who who is a very passionate restaurateur, as was as is Nigel, to thrive and excel at, at their point, which is making sure that we're delivering a great bottom line and 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 we both get a fulfillment out of doing both, being busy, making, making, making money and running a good business. Um, so it's, so the, having a partner has been absolutely instrumental to, 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 to my journey. Excellent. And, and you said about uh, kind of, you know, you're, you're heavily hands-on in, in the kitchen with the different sites. Like, but so yeah. say with, not pick up on Perilla always, but like all yeah. your other places, would you actually be hands-on with, with many design no, not no. My, my, my relationship with each restaurant is, is different depending on, yeah. okay. on on what the original idea was and, and, and who's in there i have yeah. nothing to do with the menu at perilla i might occasionally make a comment that gets that yeah. mostly gets ignored um but no those two we we try and the the the, the investors in perilla there's there's three of us um just try and bring some perspective and, and right. some experience when it comes to making big decisions and um and just help help them achieve their dream um i'm involved with the restaurant called lawn and likewise but very little involved no involvement really i would they're there to just to 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 to, to, to fly um uh kitchen wa it's been going for I don't know, 11 years now mark kempson the head chef and partner outstanding chef I was very involved with the menus in the early days, but I have no involvement anymore. I, I might pass comment, but 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 um, he's a he's he's earned it and is a truly great cook. Um, but you know, my 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 best contribution to to a restaurant really comes down to being one of the team and food. And so that's where I try and keep my focus. You know, it's uh, Ellison Street, Church Road. I'm very involved with the menus. I write all the menus. Ellison Street obviously writes all the menus. Um, I think my single greatest strength is my is my palate and um, and 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 the food. You know, the the rest is can be done by others. That's that's what I, I think. That's that's certainly what I believe is my biggest contribution. Excellent. And I'll finish up on this one, Phil. Um, and I know you said at the very beginning of the interview that there's no magic wand, there's no you know secret sauce necessarily to running a restaurant business. But I would be I'd be remiss not to ask you right for a man that has such successful restaurants and so is so long in the game. Like if you were to put it down to anything, right, the success of a restaurant, like what are the kind of key areas there? Well, I think I'm probably going to repeat a bit of what I've said here just now. I think find yourself a great partner. Okay. If you try and do it all yourself, it's a nightmare. You know, you have to have, you have to share the load. However you want to look at that, whether it's with a wife, with a husband, with a, with a business partner, you have to share the load. Um, you have to build a great team. You have to recruit fantastic people to help you realize your dream because you cannot do it all yourself. Um, and if you don't focus on that and recruit people who are not up to it, you're, 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 you're forever compromised. Um, and I think we have always been, you know, my, Nigel and Rebecca, my two partners and, and me absolutely focus on the customer. And if they don't walk out happy, they're not going to come back. And, um, and it's, and it's very easy to, to, uh, it's a very simple thing to say, but you have to put the customer experience 
at the front of every decision you make, whether it's so that it's not about has to be the customer experience. And um, so I think we have we have we have looked after our customers. We have um, partnerships that ensure that we are delivering on on if not all fronts, on nearly every front, um, and we've got great people to help us achieve it. Excellent. Uh, look, another better place to leave it still. And honestly, thanks so much for your time. It was, it was amazing. It's a pleasure. It's thanks a pleasure. So thanks for watching the Business of Restaurants podcast with me, Evan O'Calley. For new episodes every single week, subscribe below.